Right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, good afternoon to all fellow South Africans, and good day to any listeners from around the world. My name is Duncan Napier, and I work for the SQM office in South Africa. On behalf of SQM, I'd really like to welcome you all, and thank you all for signing into this webinar. It's a real privilege and a pleasure to have you listening in, and I hope that you get a few meaning points from it. Today's webinar is titled Greenhouse Nutrient Solution Management in Closed Systems. We have two presentations lined up pertinent to this topic. But just before we start, I'd like to thank Johanna Madero Ferguson from SQ Marketing for her hard work in making this webinar possible. Thank you, Johanna. As the listeners, if you have any questions during this presentation or presentations, please ask them by writing in the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. If time permits, these questions will be answered today. And if not today, then each question will be answered to you individually at a later stage. Our first speaker today is Dr. Estelle Kempen. Dr. Kempen will present on nutrient management in reticulated greenhouse systems or enclosed systems. Dr. Kempen is a senior lecturer and a researcher at the Department of Agronomy, Agronomy at the University of Stellenbosch. Dr. Kempen focuses on vegetable production. She's a crop physiologist with a keen interest in crop nutrition and the link with sustainable production practices and post-harvest quality. Dr. Kempen is also co-author of a book with Dr. Nick Combrink titled Nutrient Solution Management. This book, you, if you can see it or if you haven't seen it, uh, it is available from uh, Dr. Kempen. You can contact me if you, if you need to get the book. Um, and it is really a must-have book if you want to understand nutrient solutions. So thank you for your participation, Dr. Kempen. Our second speaker today is our own Dr. Katya Hora from SQM. Dr. Hora will present on the benefits of iodine in plant nutrition and iodine management in greenhouse crops. Dr. Hora is from the Netherlands and works out of our SQM head office in Antwerp, Belgium. She is the head of research and development in SQM worldwide. And Dr. Hora has been coordinating our work on iodine for a number of years. And also thank you, Dr. Hora, for your time. So without further ado, um, I hand over to, to Dr. Kempen. Thank you, Estelle. Thank you, Duncan. Yeah, and thanks so much for inviting me to come and give this presentation today. Really looking forward to it. So before I start, I just want to, yeah, our aim for today, I thought it would be uh, wise to maybe start just with a little bit of a background um, as to greenhouse production in itself uh, and nutrient use and fertilizer use in greenhouse vegetable production systems. And then we can start delving a little bit deeper into how do we manage um, nutrition uh, in these intensive systems and then specifically, how do we manage it in um, closed recirculating systems? So if we look all around the world, uh, we see that still protected yeah. cultivation. So protected cultivation includes um, greenhouses, net houses, tunnels. Um, it's still on the increase. And I think with, with climate change and all the challenges we're having in terms of soil quality and water quality and availability, it's, it's going to continue to... Um, increase. At the moment, they reckon there's almost 5.6 million hectares um, of covered greenhouse vegetables alone. Um, so the thing with intensive cropping systems like these is normally it's quite intensive on the pocket as well. So it's a big investment that you make. So you need to optimize each and every step in this process to make sure that um, you get the return on the investment. And one of those factors is you need to make sure that you optimize your water and nutrient supply to your crops. 
Um, so optimizing this water and nutrient supply to your crops um, will result in high yields, which um, is what you want, also good quality um, produce. Um, but it's also it also goes hand in hand with very high uh, um, input levels of fertilizers. So we know that for, for most crops, uh, all crops basically, uh, increase in your fertilizer rate will normally increase your, your uptake and an increase in uptake um, is linked to an increase in fresh yield. So these two examples, just um, examples of two crops that's very popular in, in greenhouses, tomatoes and chrysanthemums, that shows that direct correlation between uh, your uptake of, uh, in this case, it's nitrogen and potassium, and uh, the yield of the crop. We do however, uh, also know, which is not shown on, on this graph, but if you continue uh, increasing your fertilizer rate, you will get to a point where you won't necessarily see an up, uh, increase in uptake and an increase in yield. Uh, and it's very important to know when you reach that level. So let's focus a bit on hydroponics. Uh, itself. So hydroponics, if we can just clarify, hydroponics include both your um, traditional hydroponics, which is a water culture, where your plants, we have no substrate. So the plant roots will be hanging um, in, in the water or in a furrow that's lined with a, a thin layer of water. But hydroponics also include um, crops grown in a substrate. Um, and then in that substrate, you will have a, a drip uh, fertigation and in that fertigation water, you will have all your nutrients uh, dissolved. So in this picture is just an example um, of such a nutrient solution. It will contain all your macro elements. Uh, in this picture is all the macro elements, um, but also micro elements. Um, since when we use uh, substrates, there's, there's no, normally there's no um, elements uh, within that substrate that we're using. But there's also a wide uh, range of nutrition, uh, soil, soil solutions that is being used. And we see um, a range in terms of the nutrients that's um, put in, but also in terms of the total salt content or the electrical conductivity that's used. So anything between 1.2 to 6 millisiemens per centimeter, sometimes even more, I know, and um, in the colder areas in the Netherlands, um, they can even... Um, push those uh, easy levels up even further. So in practice, it should be very easy to uh, fertigate your plants in a, in a soil a substrate because as a grower, um, you can determine exactly what you're going to give your plants and you can design this nutrition nutrient solution according to what uh, you want your crop to do. So another uh, characteristic of soil systems of hydroponics is that it's got a very small root system. Uh, many reasons for this. Uh, one of it is time saving, but another is also that it allows you as a grower to, to steer your crop. Um, but yeah, these small root systems can result in some problems if not managed properly. So we sometimes we see uh, uh, salt uh, constant, uh, pockets of uh, high salt contents in the in the root zones, or you can also see that some of your essential elements can quickly deplete. Uh, so you need to keep your, your hand on this, and you need to make sure that you know exactly what is happening in that root zone. So fertigation management, a very important part of, of soilless um, systems, and it's also very closely linked to, uh, to um, your fertilizer, to your nutrition in soilless systems. Normally, we will give um, many small um, irrigation events, um, and that will help us to, to limit those fluctuations in your root zone. So rather than just irrigating once or twice a day, you'll actually have um, up to 15 to 20 um, smaller irrigations. And with air irrigation, you're not only um, supplying water, but you're also replenishing those nutrient concentrations in your root zone to those optimal levels that you you created um, with your nutrient solution right at the beginning. Uh, the amount of water that you give in, in this substrate is also very different from what we uh, give in uh, soil-grown crops. So it can range between 4 to 12 liters per square meters versus uh, 75 to 150 liters per square meters for a similar crop um, in soil. And then irrigation management in greenhouses 
also very closely, although we do it in open field crops as well, but I think um, in greenhouses it's, uh, it's more the norm that you actually irrigate based on your evapotranspiration, um, which is linked to your uh, climate in your, in your greenhouse. So your solar radiation, your temperature, and also your vapor, press, 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 va vapor pressure deficit or your relative humidity. So, yeah, as I said before, so this small root zone that we have, it can be a problem, but it can also be a benefit. Um, the benefit is that you can quickly change um, what you give to your, your crop, so you can adapt it according to the demand. So if you have quick changes in, in climates, uh, if we have, in, especially here in the Western Cape where we are, the one day it can be um, in the, the high 30s and the next day it's, it's almost winter. So you need to make those quick adjustments to what you give um, your, your water and the nutrients that you give your crop. You don't want um, a too, too wet and soggy um, root zone. Um, but you also don't want it to, to dry out too much. Um, also, in terms of crop steering, it allows you to quickly change um, the, the ratio between your nutrients. So, for instance, if your crop is going from a vegetative to a reproductive phase, you want to increase that potassium concentration relative to your um, nitrogen. It's very easy, or not very easy, but much easier than in soil to make those changes. The flip side of this is, however, that it's, it sounds very easy on paper, but it's not always that easy. And, um, yeah, it, it's, it, you often see in practice that things like poor water quality or uh, under irrigation, um, or, yeah, can lead to, to problems in that, in that root zone. And often the best solution then is just to flush it out. So oversupply of your water and, and your nutrients. So this oversupply, which is often the norm in many um, greenhouse systems, um, leads to very high um, usage of fertilizers. So just an example here in terms of nitrogen and um, potassium. So they reckon uh, for nitrogen anywhere between 650 to 2,000 kilograms per hectare per year is applied in greenhouse systems. It depends on the crop and it depends on the type of system that is used. Um, but if you look at the, the uptake rates and the crop um, demand score for nitrogen, this application exceeds um, the, the need of the crop by far. So up to seven times more nitrogen is applied than, than what we actually need. Um, potassium almost double is applied than, um, from what, what most crops actually take up. So this is a very interesting, a, very, a recent article was a meta-analysis done by uh, Kwasim et al. Um, and in this uh, picture from that article, you can see they showed the nitrogen fluxes in, in greenhouse vegetable um, systems. Um, and they yeah, refer there to the nitrogen leaching, the amount of um, N2O emissions. And this is all from the fertilizer that's being applied. Um, and then that top value there for me was very significant, um, where they reckon the nitrogen use efficiency uh, it's only about 23.7%, which is, which is very low. So the impact of all this, um, this low use efficiency of the fertilizers that we apply um, is vast. So it's everything from, from water pollution of that excess nutrients that's, um, that's running out as wastewater, which is resulting in soil degradation, um, air pollution, um, increase in energy consumption, the way they, they got um, to that is that if you over fertilize your, your crops, often you're going to have excessive vegetative growth. And to keep those plants happy, often you need to um, incur more cooling or heating, depending on where you are. And that is uh, additional energy cost. It's not necessarily going to relate into a marketable product. And then, yeah, all these problems, the water pollution, soil degradation, air pollution, all of that also contribute to biodiversity loss. So the solution for us in, in this sector, in protected cultivation and greenhouses, is obvious, is to limit the amount of nutrients that is lost. So improve the retention rate of the nutrients within our system. And to do that, um, 
is to simply close that system. So the easiest way to do that is just to collect all the drainage water from your substrates or from your water culture um, and reuse that water. Um, easier said than done. So the reuse obviously has a big environmental impact. As we just saw, it can reduce the uh, pollution of your groundwater and other environmental uh, factors. And also it can reduce the uh, um, bleaching of, of those uh, fertilizers into the waterways. In addition, it's got a good, uh, huge economic impact as well. Um, so if you can re re reuse some of those fertilizers, it's a cost, it will be a cost saving, um, but it's also got a, a negative e economic impact. So to be able to reuse your fertilizer and your wastewater, um, you need to be able to first to collect all that wastewater, then you need to be able to test it and you need to be able to clean it um, up to a point that you feel that it's safe enough to um, use that again. And when you speak to many uh, farmers, especially here in South Africa and now in many other countries, it's it, reusing drained water is already the norm. Um, here it's not the norm. Some people are already doing it, some not. When you speak to those who are not doing it yet, um, normally the first two factors here are, is the, the main concern. The main concern is uh, disease control and people are very hesitant um, to reuse uh, water if they're not sure that um, it's pathogen free. And then second of all is that additional cost that I just listed in terms of um, tanks to collect it, the pumping, uh, the testing, um, the cleaning of that wastewater. And what very few of them uh, are, are listing, but to me is actually a major, major um, of major importance. And actually, what we're covering in this topic today is actually the nutrients in that water. And how do you manage the nutrients um, that is leaching out of your medium um, for reuse? Okay, so there are basically two systems that can be used when we look at a closed system. So the first of all is where we collect all the drained nutrient solution. Um, it's in a, in a drainage tank. Um, normally, the volume of this collected drain water is much smaller than that what we um, supply to the, to the plant. So it's similar to when we use a, a drain to waste system where you work on a between a 20 and a 50 percent uh, drainage volume. Um, so the composition of that water also differs significantly from what your input solution was. So there's big differences uh, that you need to adjust, so both in pH and EC, but also in the specific nutrients in that solution. So if we look at those type of systems, this will typically be um, that type of system where you have your grow bags and underneath the grow bags you will have some kind of a gutter system. It can either be raised beds or it can be on the floor. Um, like yeah, the system that we've implemented now here at the university is on the floor in um, gutters where we collect the, the drain water. That drain water is sent to a sump. Um, then it will be treated before it is blended back into your, um, into your main system. Then the other type of um, closed system will be the continuous recirculation system. So for these systems, that water is continually um, recycled. So you don't necessarily need an additional sump to collect it. It also means that um, the drainage volume is much larger compared to your input volume, which is an advantage because the, the changes in the nutrient solution composition is much smaller than um, in the previous system. Um, so you can, in theory, you can recirculate these systems for a much longer time until you get to a point where um, there needs to be an indicator to know um, that now is actually the the right time to replace this nutrient solution. So those systems are your typical, your NFT type of systems um, where you have gutters um, and the nutrient solution is just running continuously through that system. So a, a little bit easier to manage. So replenishment um, of the recycled solution, the problem. So we know, as we discussed earlier, that there's this, this linear relationship between yield and nutrient uptake and your fertilizer applications. 
The problem comes in that the uptake rate and the total amount of the nutrients taken up, um, it differs between crops. It even differs between cultivars of certain crops. And it will differ between um, the harvestable parts. So big differences between something like a lettuce and, and a tomato crop um, that's got different harvestable uh, components. And then in addition to that, it's also influenced by your, your growing period, how long that crop is growing. And then also it will be determined by the concentration um, of your nutrient solution and the ratios of the specific ions in that nutrient solution. So it becomes it becomes quite complex um, if you delve too deep. So this is what you often see. This is some trials that we did uh, here at the university where we just had a solution that we um, continue to reuse. So in practice, what often, hap what often happens or how it's managed is um, you will have dosing systems. Those dosing systems will test your pH and your EC. And based on your pH and your EC, it will just replenish up to your desired pH EC level. But what we saw with this was, although there's quite a small change in the EC of that nutrient solution over time, um, if you look at the, the bars on that graph, the bars show the, your cations and your anions, there was quite significant uh, changes taking place within this specific and this not even the specific um, elements this is just the sum of your cations and the sum of your anions so within that solution although you if you only measure the ec you see very small changes but in effect those uh, specific elements in your solution are changing quite a lot and that can affect nutrient uptake and it can affect yield and quality of your um, product at the end of the day So, yeah, this, this graph is also just uh, shows you how it differs between different crops um, in terms of their, their uptake, their need for different elements. Um, so all, all this is basically saying is there's a difference between your crops and um, we can't manage it um, solely just on pH and uh, EC in our nutrient solutions. So again, the uptake of the macronutrients in relation to the external concentration. So we said if that external concentration is going to change, it will um, change the uptake. So as an example, we're just looking here at your potassium, phosphorus, nitrate, and sulfates. So these elements are normally absorbed in relatively high uh, quantities, even if the outside concentrations are low, um, whereas your elements like sodium, magnesium, and calcium is much more dependent on your external uh, concentration. So if we think back at uh, that graph we just saw, it means if you you not necessarily, if you only manage um, according to the EC and your calcium levels are maybe depleting in your nutrient solutions, you're not picking it up because you're only seeing the differences in, in um, the total EC, uh, you're actually going to exacerbate this, this problem even further by not um, monitoring specific elements. So one of the reasons for, for the selectivity and, and uptake is the, the membranes. So we've got membrane permeability um, where that affects nutrient uptake. So you have your uncharged molecules that's always taken up much easier. Then you have your cation with a, a single charge, cations and anions with single charge. Um, then your cations and anions um, that's uh, with your with the double charge. So this is where your your calciums comes in, uh, as well as the magnesiums, and then your um, cations and anions with a with a three charge. So yeah, the lower they are on on this graph, um, the more difficult it will become for for them to be taken up through the membranes. Um, selectivity and uptake between different elements. Just an example here also. So we mentioned potassium, uh, phosphorus, and nitrate. So they're very actively taken up. So even uh, against the electrochemical gradient, so even a, at a really high EC, we see that they are actively taken up. But then you have uh, your elements like your sulfate, calcium, magnesium, so that um, all of them are divalent. So they, again, it's a membrane um, permeability. Um, that's going to result in them being taken up a lot more passively into your cells. So if you are creating conditions on the outside in your root zone, that's going to uh, limit the uptake of the, these elements, um, it, you can run into problems. Again, if you look at the, the micronutrients, 
The manganese, again, actively taken up, but boron um, depends much more on the concentration in the root um, environment. And then you get the elements like iron, um, zinc, copper, and molybdenum. Um, that varies uh, quite a bit uh, between different crops, and you need to know your crop and the specific uptake rate of, of these elements. Uh, yeah, this picture is just to show basically that membrane permeability and the active and passive transport of the different uh, different elements. Um, important to remember this when uh, looking at your nutrient solution and how you adjust the ratios between between the different um, elements. Another important thing, I think this takes uh, many of you back to um, the soil science as well, is a builder's chart. So we remember these antagonisms and synergisms between the different elements so again very important in our root zone that small root zone that we have that we can manipulate um, if you're going to have a excess or um, accumulation of one of these elements what will be the effect on the other elements in your um, in your nutrient solution and it become becomes much more pronounced in a in a soilless culture than um, in a well buffered soil so, yeah, these are just examples of some of these. We're not going to go through all of them, but just, I just want to show that you need to, you need to know these when you are making up your nutrient solutions. What is the effect of high levels of nitrogen, for instance, on the uptake of your other um, elements, um, or calcium, for instance, high levels of calcium that can, um, also link to your, your boron, um, uptake. Um, know these interactions between your specific, um, elements when you look at your um, analysis before you make your corrections. So these are just um, some more antagonism interactions of the, the micro elements. So iron, for instance, um, iron deficiency is often accentuated by um, low potassium levels or high levels of copper magazine, uh, manganese and zinc. And we've seen this before when we did some trials in um, uh, a homemade type of uh, NFT system here, the experimental farm, um, which uh, yeah excreted some zinc into that that system, which we didn't pick up at first, and we didn't see the zinc toxicity, but we definitely saw that iron deficiency. So sometimes the first thing that you see is actually not the problem, um, and you need to go and dig a little bit further to find that root cause uh, of the of the deficiency that you are noticing. pH effects. Uh, very important as well. They can, your pH can change very fast in a nutrient solution in a soil system. Um, and also as your plant takes up more either anions or cations, it can also have an effect on your, on your pH levels, especially if your, if your nutrient solution is not well buffered. So as an example, if your anion uptake is larger than your cation uptake, um, you will have a, a increase in your bicarbonate, um, a concentration in your water and often this is then linked to to uh, increase in ph um, and that increase in the ph can then result in the antagonisms again or the or the um, depression of uptake of certain of your micro elements especially uh, cation uptake that's larger than anion uptake um, and this often happens um, when we add too much ammonia in our nutrient solutions and also in combination with low light intensity, because we know low light intensity, we need light for nitrate reductase in our roots. Um, so if low light, um, that system is not working properly, and it can also lead to um, problems in terms of um, uptake of other elements. Um, and then of course, in terms of buffering of your, your water, before you start uh, making up your nutrient solutions, especially if you use something like a, a, a rainwater, you need to buffer that water before, uh, make sure that it's well buffered before you start adding your fertilizers into your tanks. Okay, so the result, what we see uh, because of the selective uptake in the, in the solutions is um, on practical results is often that the composition of that drain solution differs significantly. It's that graph that I showed you earlier. Um, but if you look at the specific elements, what we see is there's a change in the potassium magnesium ratio and there's a change in our potassium to calcium um, ratio. Um, and then sulfates often accumulate because um, of that selectivity and uptake. 
And of course, the sodium and chloride concentrations will increase. Although plants do take up sodium and chloride, um, the requirement for it is, is much, much lower than, for instance, for um, your potassium and, and nitrates. Um, and yeah, all these accumulations and depletions, again, it's very much linked to the, uh, your, your quality of your feeding water that you start off with. So this is just a visual of what I just said. Um, so if you start off, there's your optimum macro elements in your solution that you carefully planned. Um, and as the plant is taking up what it needs at that specific time, um, you will see a change in, in what is drained out at the bottom of, the, of your um, um, substrate. So there you can see there's um, accumulation of your calcium and magnesium in the sulfates because of that selectivity of uptake and a depletion of, um, especially your nitrates um, get depleted very, very fast. So the practical implications, how do you, how do we, how do we fix this scenario? So first of all, we can make adjustments um, to your input solution that you start off with in, in re recirculating systems. Uh, so if you're growing in a, in a closed system, it's going to look, your nutrient solution is going to look a little bit different from what you use in a, in a drain to waste system. You will have a little bit more um, ammonia to nitrate for your total um, in, uh, need. Um, so this increase in cation absorption will re release your hydrogen um, ions and will inhibit that increase in your, in your pH. So it just um, stabilizes your pH a little bit. Um, but just remember, there's also specific crops have specific tolerances for ammonia in nutrient solutions. Uh, then also increase in, in the, the nitrate plus phosphate versus your sulfates. So the sulfates are accumulating. So we want to um, reduce the sulfates compared to your nitrates and, and phosphates in the solution. And then in high sodium chloride feeding water, um, uh, you will have to uh, implement additional strategies to uh, there's actually very few things that you can do with sodium chloride and at the end of the day you're going to have to implement a strategy just to flush out some of that um, uh, water just to get to a, a level that's safe for your crop and then also higher potassium to calcium and higher magnesium uh, uh, potassium to magnesium ratios in your recirculating solution so the aim, what we're trying to do with these solutions is we're trying to balance our input with our uptake. Um, so if our input is higher than our uptake of our crop, and for this you need to know your specific crop, what is the uptake concentrations for your specific crop under your growing conditions. Um, but if your input higher than the uptake, you will have accumulation. If your input is too low again, if you go the other way, um, then you can get iron depletion. So the most important thing to do is regular monitoring uh, of what is going on in your grain medium and in your drainage water. So this is what you need. You need somebody like this. This picture I took quite a few years ago already. This was in, in, in Belgium, um, where they have this service, where they have technicians that will go out yeah. um, to the greenhouses. They will uh, collect some water from your slabs. The best is not to take um, water that's drained out in your gutters. It's actually to collect the water from the from the grain media, from your root zone. Um, that water is collected. It's sent to the lab. It's analyzed um, on the same day, preferably. Uh, and by the next morning, the grower can have a report as to how they need to adjust the nutrient solution for continued success. Um, yeah, so just to add, um, that that type of system is, is not implemented everywhere. I think in, in, in my in my view, that's the ideal, and we'll uh, keep on trying to get it implemented here in South Africa as well. So how that, how that process basically looks um, can get quite complicated, um, but this is just a, a a simplified version of how that adjustment is being done. So first of all, we need to know what the EC is in your root zone. Um, you then need to calculate the contribution of um, your sodium chloride or your, let's call them the unwanted um, elements to that total EC. Uh, you will then take your, your um, recipe basically or your levels of macronutrients that you started off with 
um, or your target values, and then you will calculate what is the deviation from that, what you measured in your root zone. Um, and then that deviation percentage will then give you an indication of how much you need to adjust your um, adjusted recipe for future use. So this is an example of, of how this is done with a micro elements. So you will do it the same for macros and for micros. So there in the top line, you will have your, your target root zones or target root zone levels in milligrams per liter. So this is that's your recipe. Um, then what, what you measured in your root zone, uh, from that you can then uh, calculate your, your deviation, so the difference between the two, and that percentage is then um, used to, to give you your, your new input values. Yeah, so sometimes, as I mentioned, with especially with sodium chloride, sometimes with some of the other elements as well, um, but normally it's your sodium chloride, uh, you can't make these adjustments. And the only thing left to do is basically to flush out your uh, nutrient solution. Um, and there's different ways that that is then basically treated as wastewater. And that wastewater can then be treated um, using different ways. Um, I think this in this picture is one of the ways it's still uh, in commercial settings used most, where you basically um, slowly filter this high nutrient content water through um, uh, yeah, a, a, a reed bed or a, 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 yeah, a bed filled with plants that will take up or, or transform some of these nutrients uh, in the solution uh, until you get to water that's a good enough quality that it can be released into the water system. Uh, there's some other ways as, as well that we can treat this wastewater. Uh, sorry. So it's instead of just um, yeah waiting until your sodium chloride levels reach a critical level, uh, which uh, some growers will do, there's another way of uh, easier managing this, and that is actually to determine um, yeah, to determine that level um, that it will build up in your solution, so you can have a, period, a periodical discard of the nutrient solution. So in other words, discarding a little bit. Um, every now and then um, to keep those uh, levels below a toxic level for your specific crop. So to do these calculations, again, you will need to have your know what, what is your input. So for sodium chloride, normally it's not from your fertilizers. It can be, um, but normally it will be in your water source. You need to know how much is taken up by your crop, um, what is in your substrate, um, and then you can, from that, you can calculate how much you need to discharge to keep below your um, upper limit for your crop. So you need to know your, your crop level as well. Um, and yeah, they are, these levels are listed for different crops um, under different grain conditions. So I mentioned earlier that there's uh, different ways of treating your greenhouse wastewater. Uh, so the one is, um, um, that reed beds that you can use. Another one that's gaining a lot of attention and there's a lot of research being done um, and here and there I've, I've seen it implemented, um, but a lot of potential is to actually use this wastewater to, to grow microalgae. This microalgae can be used for everything from uh, medicinal purposes to food sources. Uh, so there's just a link if you want to go and have a look uh, more of the, of the work that's being done at um, the Wageningen uh, University on this as well. So, yeah, techniques. So I mentioned um, briefly those calculations that um, that you can do to determine how you need to adjust your nutrient solutions. And that's just a snapshot. If you're interested in, in, in more detail on that, we also do workshops um, showing people exactly how to do that from your water, uh, taking your water um, analysis to your input solutions, to your um, analysis of the, of your um, uh, uh, wastewater and how to do those adjustments. So, so feel free to contact me if you want some more information. And then there's also some other ways it's being researched um, um, and some somewhat implemented with varying degrees of success that we can uh, manage the nutrient solutions better um, in our systems. 
So one of them is to use online um, nutrient analysis. So what this means is instead of having to collect that wastewater, sending it um, away for analysis, getting it back and doing those calculations, you will actually have ions in your system that can measure each of these specific. So you will have one for nitrates, one for your potassium, one for phosphates. Um, like I said, I've, I've seen varying degrees of this working and not working. Um, I think it needs to be refined a little bit more, but a lot of potential for future use. And then the next one, and this is something I've done a lot of work on, uh, a lot of work. Um, so my whole PhD thesis was on this, was to try and create um, models of nutrient uptake. So we know um, what is driving crop growth and development um, from the cl climate to the nutrient to the water uptake. Um, so if we can get enough data, we can um, get to a point where we can start predicting um, what the crops will be taking up. Um, and if you know what the crops will be taking up and using, you know what will be left over in the nutrient solution that you supplied. And you can almost preemptively um, adjust these nutrient solutions to not get to a place where you have um, deficiencies or accumulations of nutrients in the solution. But yeah, so that's also still um, a lot of work that needs to, to be put in to refine those models. Good. Um, yeah, that's me. Thanks for listening. And um, yeah, if you want more information, you're welcome to contact me. Uh, my contact details on that slide there. Thank you, Estelle. Um, it was most interesting. I think that there will be a lot of questions. Um, you know, for anyone wanting to go into this, for me, it's 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 a matter of, of, of getting testing done timelessly and then obviously being able to do the mathematical calculations for the corrections. But I also like your your modeling where you can preempt it. You know, that'll be the future, I think. But anyway, thank you very much. Um, we'll call you up later if, uh, if there are any specific questions for you. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, Katja, so can I ask you to, to, to take over? Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. And thank you, Dr. Kempen, for this excellent presentation and your uh, advocacy for uh, recirculation of drain and uh, uh, reuse uh, of nutrients in, uh, in vegetable, which uh, is something we need to look at for the future, for sure. Um, I'm going to speak to you about the benefits of the micronutrient iodine in nutrient solutions for crops in closed fertigation systems. Well, uh, as Dr. Kempen explained, you, know, you, you, you need to have a collaboration between all these mineral nutrients to get the plant to produce sugars and vitamins and carbohydrates and proteins from water, light and carbon to support plant growth, root growth, but also to, to support the stress management uh, of a crop. Well, you see here listed 19 mineral nutrients and on, among them you see in bold the element Iodine. Now, you are not very used to see this element in this context, uh, for sure. Um, but recently, iodine is now added to the list of beneficial elements for plants in this new edition of the textbook Marshner's Mineral Nutrition of Plants, together with elements like silicon uh, and selenium, uh, which, which are known to be beneficial uh, for plants. And we are in the brink of discovering how uh, beneficial they are also for cropping systems and for vegetable systems like those under uh, recirculation. Now, um, the evidence that supported uh, the nomination of iodine as beneficial plant nutrient has been published in 2021 in this paper, uh, where three types of evidence are provided. The first one was a classic nutrient elimination experiment. So uh, iodine deficiency was induced in the nutrient solution of plants to see how an iodine deficient plant actually looks like. Uh, also, uh, genomics was done. So uh, the gene expression following exposure to a plant to the micronutrient iodine was uh, investigated but also uh, the researchers looked at uh, the evolutionary role of iodine. We know iodine is important for animals, 
but is it important for plants and does it behave the same way? Uh, can it bind covalently to proteins which have a regulatory role in the growth and development uh, of plants as it does in animals? Um, so the answer to all these questions was yes, and I'm, I'm not going to go in detail. You can download this paper. It's open access. Um, but I wanted to show you what an iodine deficient plant looks like. So you see on the left an iodine deficient plant. And this is Arab Arab Arabidopsis thaliana, which is not a commercial crop, but it's a, a plant which is a model plant for scientists to study uh, the way that nutrients interact uh, with the plant metabolism on. Well, if you would not know that this plant is iodine deficient, you would not see it. Uh, you only see it in comparison to the plant on the right, which has been supplied with 10 micromoles of iodine in a nutrient solution, so in a micronutrient dosage. And here you see that when iodine is added to the nutrient solution, the plant flowers more, flowers faster, uh, and develops more biomass. So iodine is beneficial for growth and for flowering and seed sets, but it's also important for the growth of roots as was uh, demonstrated in this trial, also performed by the researchers of the Scuola Superiore Santana in Pisa that are authored, authors of this uh, standard paper in 2021. Um, you see on the left uh, the little seedlings of Arabidopsis thaliana grown in an agar medium, which is similar to uh, media which are used for in vitro propagation for bananas or orchids, for instance. And that medium contains 0 0.6 micromole of agar by nature. Um, if you increase the amount of iodine in that medium to between 5 and 10 micromoles uh, per liter, you see that you have a longer root system and also there is more lateral root formation, so more feeder roots. Uh, it's also possible to apply an excess of iodine and you would have to go to 10 times the dose uh, which we could, would consider optimal in this uh, system. As a point of interest, the five micromoles of iodine per liter uh, is normally added in any medium uh, that includes murashige and skook, vitamins and minerals uh, for in vitro propagation of plants. So, um, from the gene expression and the analysis of proteins which can covalently bind iodine in plants, and there's 82 of them which we could identify, um, we know that iodine seems to take part in fundamental pathways of the plant metabolism. And from that we can pre predict that iodine is needed for timely flowering and fruit production, uh, for photosynthesis and sugar production, but also for root growth and importantly also in defense from stress and in a process called calcium signaling, which is like the nervous system of the plant, which the plant uses to respond to changes in its environment. So if we can predict that uh, iodine is important for these functions of uh, crops, well, how does this look like in practice? And um, what would be the best way to apply iodine in a commercial cropping system? For this, we organized a series of demonstration trials on farm to assess the benefits of iodine in these commercial uh, fields. And we developed a product called Ultrasoline for that, which is basically potassium nitrate of the highest uh, horticultural water soluble grade combined with 0.1% of iodine. So when you apply the potassium nitrate in your nutrient solution recipe, you automatically apply also iodine in a micronutrient dose. So this was a very pragmatic uh, approach which uh, allowed us to conduct these trials on a large scale. The trial all had this very uh, basic uh, setup with a control sector where uh, a crop was fertigated uh, long farm practice, the normal nutrient solution used by the growers uh, with the standard amount of potassium nitrate in their nutrient solution recipe. Any other sector had exactly the same uh, nutrient solution, same crop, same planting date, same crop management, 
but instead of the normal grade of potassium nitrate, ultrasoline was used, resulting in the only difference between the two sectors of iodine being applied as a micronutrient in the treated sector. So this product is now also in the market and available in South Africa. Uh, as said, it's the highest quality potassium nitrate suitable for hydroponics and contains a well-defined amount of iodine. And with that, it's very easy to uh, secure an iodine supply, uh, which, which gives you approximately a correct dose of iodine in your nutrient solution. Now, we have here a summary of the 52 demonstration trials in 14 countries. You see in the light green triangles uh, the yield in these cropping systems set at 100 percent, while the yield of the ultrasaline treated uh, is represented by the dark green bullets. Now, these include uh, tomatoes, uh, but also on the far right, uh, lettuce. And the lettuce was grown in a continuous fertigation system. All the other crops were uh, open field crops with an uh, open drain system. Now, this graph showed you that we had good results in open field and soil protected crops. But what benefits were found in the high tech closed systems? We applied ultrasaline K plus also in closed fertigation systems in the Netherlands and Canada. And the base of the recipe used in those trials were the ones you can find here in this manual nutrient solution for greenhouse crops, as is as you have a possibility to download from our, our website. Let me show you, oh, we'll start here first. Um, when can you expect a crop to uh, suffer from iodine deficiency? Um, we've established that in greenhouse systems like this, when you have uh, crops grown out of the soil and you have a protected environment, uh, preventing a direct rainfall on the crop, the water that is used for irrigation, fertigation, is the main source of iodine for these crops by nature. So they will risk to be iodine deficient if there's not sufficient uh, iodine in that nutrient solution. Well, that this is the case uh, has been shown in Brazil. In this lettuce crop, in hydroponics, uh, nutrient film technique, uh, continuous recirculated nutrient solution. Um, with iodine, we saw a better root development and leaf development only 13 days after transplant of the seedlings in the, in the uh, production tables. And we established by measuring the amount of iodine in the water that indeed in the uh, systems where iodine was not applied, um, the amount of iodine found in this nutrient solution was extremely low. It was there, but it was low. Um, Consequently, the growers in Brazil profited from the availability of iodine for the crop by having an earlier harvest because the crop develops so much faster. So, we keep as a rule of thumb that uh, irrigation water in a, in a cropping system under fertigation should be at least one micromole of iodine per liter. So, let me show you um, some examples of how low is the endemic concentration of iodine in most irrigation waters in agriculture and uh, how the application of ultrasaline K plus in a recirculated crop system would add to that native amount of iodine. First, uh, 
this slide shows you the results of the work of uh, Duncan uh, collecting samples all over South Africa and in 42 samples which were collected from the East Coast to the West Coast we found that more than 90% of them contained less than one micromole of iodine per liter of nutrients of uh, irrigation water. And uh, on average, there was only 0 0.5 micromole of iodine per liter in the water from uh, all different sources which are used by agriculture. Uh, in this slide, I've included uh, 11 um, trials which we did in uh, the Netherlands but also Canada in tomato and bell pepper, cucumber and eggplant where ultrasaline K plus was used as a source of potassium nitrate in a fully recirculated nutrient solution. So this would be the ones that are recirculating the drain, so the more high tech systems as Estelle explained to you. Um, the light green bar gives you the average value of uh, iodine in the drip solution when uh, ultrasaline K plus is applied, which is four micromoles of iodine per liter approximately. And uh, in the drain, we found uh, coming back from the slabs uh, around eight micromole uh, per liter of iodine. Now, these values are not corrected for EC, and the EC in the drain tends to be a bit higher than from the drip solution in these type of systems. Um, so, uh, with application of iodine in potassium nitrate, you will have some variation um, of the absolute value of iodine, which you find in your nutrient solution. But we did find some benefits with these values within this range. Um, more importantly, we find that the effect of iodine deficiency on a crop seems to be enlarged when there's uh, climatic stress involved in the crop production, such as rooting problems, salinity, heat, cold, or low light. As an example, this was a trial in the Netherlands uh, in stone wool uh, with 100% recirculated drain where ultrasoline improved the quality of tomato fruits developed from the flowers, which you see here in um, oh, July, uh, where we had a heat wave of over 40 degrees Celsius for some days at outside temperature. We had a heat wave in August. And finally, we harvested, harvested these fruits uh, end of September. Um, to see what the um, I'm struggling with my controls, uh, to see what the heat waves did uh, to the quality of the fruits. Now, here's the result on fruit weight. Uh, you see in the iodine deficient control greenhouse, the average fruit weight was only 113 gram per fruit, while the average fruit weight uh, in the ultrasoline uh, sectors. Uh, was uh, normal around 126 gram per fruit. Now, we took this observation from practice uh, to the science again. So in the laboratory of, uh, it of Professor uh, Pier Domenico Perata in uh, Italy, uh, we repeated this heat shock trial uh, on microton tomatoes grown in a closed environment in climate chambers. So totally controlled condition where we exposed the plants after having uh, fed them either uh, normal uh, nutrient solution or nutrient solution amended with iodine to five micromole per liter. Uh, for 10 days, we exposed them to a day-night temperature of 40 to 25 degrees Celsius. On the left, you can see that on the normal temperature, the plants yielded 98 gram per plant. But under stress conditions, as you see here, the plants lost yield and only 72 gram of tomato fruits per plant was harvested. While in the ultrasoline uh, section, which is here with the five micromole per liter, you see that the plants under stress still yielded 88 gram per plant. So 22% more yield than the control plants under stress conditions. So iodine uh, protects uh, against 
uh, stress from heat, but it also protects, it also uh, helps the plant to keep up their calcium level in the fruits uh, during dark and uh, cold uh, periods, as was demonstrated in this trial in Almeria, in the cherry tomato, where um, the iodine fed plants in the period between, oh, in the period between uh, December and January uh, reached high, consistently higher levels of uh, calcium in their fruits compared to the iodine deficient control. Now, um, the same tomatoes in the Dutch trial as I showed you the fruit weight on also contained more calcium in their dry matter of the fruits. So even though the fruits were bigger, they also contained more calcium. And this resulted in a less uh, botrytis rot uh, after two weeks of storage at uh, room temperature. Another important function of calcium in the fruits is prevention of blossom and rot. And these uh, peppers uh, in Morocco, uh, the control plants contained or exhibited uh, a high percentage, a high incidence of these uh, blossom and um, affected fruits. Um, but in the iodine sector, in iodine greenhouse, we hardly uh, found these uh, damaged fruits. And also the end result for the grower was 14% uh, higher uh, export quality uh, yield. Now, um, we saw that um, iodine can protect plants against uh, yield loss under heat stress. Um, we also uh, had feedback from Dutch growers of bell peppers also in these recirculated uh, substrate systems um, that they were surprised uh, at uh, how good the quality of their fruits was uh, despite periods of uh, hot weather, which usually uh, gives them some fruit abortion or just a, a lower fruit set and a lower quality of fruit. So we investigated if iodine can protect the viability of uh, pollen. Uh, from heat stress uh, in pepper plants. And, and the answer is yes, uh, iodine can protect as is demonstrated in this trial, uh, where in the control situation after exposure of uh, plants with flower buds like this for 24 hours uh, to 35 degrees Celsius, um, hardly any uh, pollen is still living in those flowers uh, in the control plants, but 25% viable pollen is found if the nutrient solution is amended with four micromoles of iodine per liter. So um, this is my last slide. It's an elaborate slide. It's a recently published uh, work in uh, it's called Improvement in Fruit Yield and Tolerance to Salinity of Tomato Plants, authored by uh, Kiefer et al, also from the group in PISA, uh, which uh, clearly uh, confirmed previous work done on this subject that iodine can also protect uh, plants from negative effects due to salinity in the nutrient solution. And for the sake of time, I will not explain this further, just to point out that uh, 10 micromoles of iodine was applied in this trial over a moderate salinity stress of uh, 30 millimoles of uh, sodium chloride. And this still resulted in a higher uh, yield of these plants despite this stress. Um, so with that, I will end my information. Uh, I know it's a lot, but for sure, most of the information presented here, you can uh, retrieve through our website or we will be sure, uh, happy to uh, share with you any uh, links to uh, papers on this subject. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I will hand the, work, the word over to back to Duncan. Yeah, thank you very much, Katya. It's a very interesting topic and I know you've worked on it for a long time and 
it's very, very clear that iodine is deficient in 90% of our water in, in, in this country. So one can expect uh, uh, an increase in quality and, and in yield and in quality with, with most of our crops. There is an interesting question um, from Andrea Isazen. Uh, do you have similar data for pomegranates? Uh, that's for you, Katya. And also uh, from Ken uh, Yatman, and he is asking about the iodine forms. You know, is it potassium iodide that we use or potassium iodate? Uh, and which one is better taken up by the plants? So, Katya, if you can answer perhaps those two questions. I, I know we're a little bit over time, but another two or three minutes and... Uh, these, 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 are, these are easy questions to answer. Uh, for Andrea, we did one trial in India on pomegranates, um, which was a field trial, and we had some uh, positive uh, effect on uh, the yield, mainly on fruit size. But uh, it would be good to repeat uh, a trial like that again. Uh, and for uh, Kent, um, yeah, iodide and iodate both are taken up by plants. Um, it's, iodide is quicker, is taken up by plants faster, but if you go through the literature, most benefit for, of the plant is from iodate. And the mechanism by that, of that is not well known, but uh, iodate is uh, in general also considered the safer form uh, of iodine for plants, uh, exactly because it's taken up more in a more controlled matter, manner by plants. So the plant has more control over the uptake of iodine from iodate than it has from iodine. Thank you. Um, okay, I see no further questions now, but uh, this is still an open conversation or open line to all of you who are listening and all of you who are interested. Uh, because both Dr. Kempen and Dr. Hora are available to answer more questions. And I think especially uh, the importance of, of recirculating systems. Um, I mean, it's easy in the NFT and gravel flow techniques to recirculate, but as soon as you're going to uh, your tomatoes and cucumbers and those greenhouse crops, it's more difficult. But I think it's certainly worthwhile from an environmental point of view and a cost-saving point of view. Um, so that wraps up the um, webinar for today. Um, there were a couple of links uh, placed um, for, for various articles. If you, if you don't remember those links, just um, uh, get hold of me and, and I will send them on to you. I think we will be posting this webinar onto, onto YouTube uh, in the new, near future so you can look at it and study it again in your own leisure. So thanks very much for your time, but especially thank you to, to Katya and Estelle. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your detailed presentations. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending, and have a good afternoon.